All right, so this is the uh, part three of six. This is the lecture series, uh, The Etiology of Obesity, where we really talk about what the, um, what causes the, us to gain weight and what we can do to try and lose that weight. So this is the way that we understand uh, obesity right now. So as you can see, we have the main player here is the insulin. So if the insulin level is too high, that's really what drives the uh, obesity and it drives the behaviors of gaining weight. And there's, uh, the first thing that was recognized was that carbohydrates, uh, especially the refined carbohydrates, tend to make people gain weight. And that's been known for many, many years. Uh, if you were to ask, ever ask your grandmother, you know, she'd say, stop eating sugar, stop eating starchy foods. And those foods, which are the, called the fattening carbohydrates, you know, mostly like flour and sugar, uh, bread, potatoes, those things tend to raise the serum insulin. Um, but it wasn't enough, because what happens over time is that high insulin levels, as we explained in the second part of the series, actually causes you to develop resistance. The resistance uh, actually feeds back in a vicious cycle. That is, as you have higher insulin levels, you have higher resistance. As you have higher resistance, you then have higher insulin levels. And it goes back in a vicious cycle. So pretty soon, it's no longer the foods which are driving the high insulin levels. It's the, uh, it's the insulin itself which is driving the high insulin levels. So it's important to try and break this cycle somehow. And that's what we really have to know, because for a lot of people, they cut out all these refined foods, and yet they still can't lose any weight. Because it's, this may not be the driving force anymore. So pretty soon after, around the 1990s, uh, there was a, a big movement towards low carbohydrate diets, which was popularized really by the Atkins diet. The American Heart Association had been providing dietary advice for many, many years. And what they had always advised was a low-fat diet, uh, as, uh, since the 1960s at least. So they're suggesting a range of 25 to 35 percent uh, total fats and low cholesterol. Um, the problem was that it didn't really work because, you know, despite that advice, people continue to gain weight. So low-carbohydrate diets have actually been around for many years. So the first published uh, report of low-carbohydrate <coughs> diets was in 1936. By the 1950s, it was actually fairly popular. So there is a doctor by the name of Dr. Pennington who wrote an uh, article in the New England Journal of Medicine talking about um, low-carbohydrate diets. And in fact, what happened was that Dr. Atkins um, was in medical school or learning at that time. So he learned from Dr. Pennington and read the article. So his diet, he didn't actually invent the diet. He said that he tried these diets because, well, that's what they taught him in medical school sort of thing. So what happened was that Dr. Atkins was uh, a cardiologist and he had started to gain weight, much like the rest of us, kind of a pound a year, two pounds a year. But slowly over those years, he started to gain weight. He couldn't lose the weight with the standard low-fat diet, and then he tried different things, but eventually he said because that's what was taught at the time, he tried a low-carbohydrate diet, and what he found was that very quickly all that weight came off. So he was working at AT&T at the time, and he decided to try it on a few patients, and he found that it was extremely successful. So he actually went on to kind of popularize it. It got uh, published in Vogue magazine, and then he went and published his book, the New Diet Revolution, which became uh, one of the fastest uh, and best-selling uh, diet books. Um, in the 1970s, it kind of uh, enjoyed a little bit of a popularization, but these are not fat-restricted, so there is a real clash between him and the American Associ Heart Association. By the 1990s, it kind of got revived as a low-carbohydrate, high-protein uh, diet, and for a few years, it was uh, very, very popular. Um, so, in 2000, when these diets were extremely popular, the American Heart Association, they hated this diet, right? They thought it was like just the worst thing. They thought it was really killing people. So they published um, some guidelines and they compared these diets, the low-carbohydrate diets, to the reduced-fat diets. And this is from one of their publications. And what you can see is that uh, the reduced-fat diet is a calorie-restricted diet, whereas the low-carbohydrate diet is not. You restrict your carbohydrates, but you don't restrict your calories. The other um, uh, difference is, is that there is uh, 
restriction in both of the food choices. The, uh, and what they note is that with the reduced fat diets, you have gradual weight loss, but you have much faster weight loss on the low carbohydrates, Atkins style diets. And they were really concerned that it was unhealthy, but if you look, you know, both of these were unproven, but if you look at the cholesterol changes, you see that on the reduced fat diets, you have um, no difference in the LDL. This is the bad cholesterol. The good cholesterol tends to increase more with the Atkins diet, which is actually a good thing. And the triglycerides tends to decrease more on the Atkins diet, which is also a good thing. However, uh, on the final part, they said that, well, we have all these concerns about the Atkins diet. That is, because it's high protein, you might get kidney stones, it might be bad for uh, kidney or liver patients, and they're concerned particularly about this, the atherogenicity. That is, it's clogging your arteries, right? That's the real big concern. And the concerns they have about the reduced fat diet was none. They actually thought this diet was just great. This is really the way to go. And this is not that long ago, that was about 12 years ago. So starting around 2000, there was a number of uh, trials uh, published which were really comparing one to the other because uh, they really wanted to show that the people, that these Atkins diets were very, very dangerous to you. So the earliest trials started getting published around 2003. So this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and they basically uh, took 132 patients and they randomized them. That is half of the group they gave a low fat diet and half of the group they gave the Atkins style diet. And they wanted to see what happened at the end of six months. And what they found was that in the short term at least, the Atkins style diet actually did much better. So whereas the low fat diets they were recommending dropped about two kilos, the other diets dropped closer to six kilos. So much better short term uh, weight loss. Another uh, trial which was fairly well publicized at the time was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2007. And basically they actually, they, they took four different diet plans, okay, so 300 patients, they randomized them, so, you know, they took a group of people and randomly assigned them to four different, um, four different diets. And what you can see is that one diet really stands out as having more weight loss than the rest. And that diet turned out to really a lot of people's surprise was the Atkins diet because everybody had been calling this a fad diet and thought it was very bad. But it turns out that there was actually substantially better weight loss on the Atkins style diet. So the other three, which is the Zone, the Ornish, and the Standard, which is a kind of low fat diet, they're all fairly similar. So they lose about two kilos, whereas the Atkins diet was about twice as effective in the short term. So it really looked like these low carbohydrate diets, to really a lot of people's surprise, was actually better at causing people to lose weight. The other thing that was actually a bit of a surprise to myself when I read it for the first time was that they actually looked like they were better for you. Because again, if you look at the uh, difference between the Atkins diet, which is a low carbohydrate, versus the Ornish diet, which is a very low fat diet, and you compare not just the weight, but you start to compare some of the uh, other, uh, you know, lab work and blood tests, you can see that they actually started to do better. So this is the good cholesterol, the HDL is the good cholesterol, so on the Atkins diet, it actually went up about five uh, points, whereas no, the, the Ornish diet caused no change. So in fact, this is better in terms of the Atkins. If you look at the triglycerides, higher levels uh, or lower levels are better for you, you can see that the Atkins diet also had better triglyceride. So the, the, the good cholesterol was better, the triglycerides was better on the Atkins diet. If you look at the measures of the sugars, you can look at insulin, you can look at glucose, and this is the three-month average of your sugars called the hemoglobin A1C, you can see again all three of those measures uh, were significantly better on the Atkins uh, style diet. And finally, even on the blood pressure, you can see that the blood pressure actually was better on the Atkins diet. So the blood pressure went down about 7.6, uh, whereas the standard diet only went down 1.9. So really on a lot of measures, the Atkins diet was really uh, a lot better. In fact, this is the, the, a lot of the, the, the same problems that 
kind of cluster together. So people who have the problems with um, weight also tend to have the sugar problem, the cholesterol problem, blood pressure problem. And all of those seem to be better on the Atkins diet. So uh, another, uh, another trial which was published shortly thereafter, which was uh, again in the New England Journal of Medicine, looked at the same sort of things. Uh, it was done in Israel and what they did was they actually had, this was one of the best trials done because they actually uh, did it at, at work and they did it so that they had um, the lunch given to the people. So the dietary compliance was very high. That is, people are kind of giving you what to eat or you're choosing what to eat from separate booths, right? So there's three different booths. One is a kind of Mediterranean diet, one is a uh, Atkins style diet, one is a low fat diet. But instead of having to, to, to make your own food at the lunchtime at the workplace, they would actually, you just go to different uh, places in the cafeteria. So the compliance was very high. And what they wanted to see again was what the difference is between these three diets. And what they found um, is that the, the one diet which really stands out, uh, the, the Mediterranean and the uh, Atkins uh, stood out as better, but one, the one that stood out as really bad compared to the other two was the low fat diet. This is the American Heart Association diet and the diet that we had actually been uh, telling all our patients for the last 30, 40 years to follow. In fact, it was really the worst one of all. Both the Mediterranean Act and the Atkins diet, uh, shown here and here, were actually much better for you. But again, that's not the surprise because by then we, we kind of already knew that the weight loss was better. Um, but what was the, the big surprise was that it looked like a healthier diet. So you could measure these other things such as, again, if you look at the cholesterol levels, this red uh, bar is the low fat diet and again it really stands out as the worst diet in terms of all these parameters of the cholesterol. So if you look at the good cholesterol, so higher is better, you can see that the Atkins diet was the best one. If you look at the triglycerides, again, uh, the lower is better. You can see that what stands out here is that the, the, the low fat diet, the heart association diet was the worst of them all. Uh, again, not much difference on the, the LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, but the ratio of the, uh, the bad to the good cholesterol, uh, again, what stands out is that the best one is the Atkins and the worst one is the low-fat diet. So again, a real surprise to, to, to many people. If you look further at something called inflammation, so we measure inflammation with uh, this thing called the uh, high-sensitivity CRP. And that, uh, according to how high it is, you can see uh, how much risk you are at heart disease and strokes and that sort of thing. So the lower your inflammation, the better. And again, what really stands out is that the low fat diet, the heart association diet was the worst, and the Atkins was really the best. If you look at the sugars, again, this is that three month average of hemoglobin A1C. You can see that the best one is the Atkins, the worst one is the low fat diet. So surprisingly, it was, uh, you know, these, um, these uh, diets had shown to be much healthier than the previous ones. And these are the ones that the, the Heart Association was really, really fighting against. But it seemed, uh, it seemed to be the opposite. It not only caused better weight loss, but it seemed that it was uh, much healthier for you. The other thing that's really important with uh, weight loss is not simply the initial weight loss, but whether you can keep it off. Because really the, the, the key is that in a six month study, you often see that people uh, <coughs> lose weight. But then over the long term, it all seems to be regained. So there was a few trials that had looked at that. And we've talked about that in the first session about why you regain that weight uh, and, and how the body acts really as a thermostat. There's like a set point. And if you don't uh, adjust that set point, what happens is that the body actually tries to regain that weight. So they looked at several different <coughs> diets in terms of how well it keeps the weight off as well. So th this is a uh, trial published again in the New England Journal of Medicine and they took um, 773 patients and again they were randomized after they had lost 10% of their weight. So four, four different groups they had uh, either they adjusted the protein, so <coughs> LP is low protein, HP is high protein, or they adjusted it according to the glycemic index, which is how high the sugars rise after each food. And so you can have a high glycemic index or a low glycemic index. So 
So high glycemic index are those foods that raise the sugars like the sugars and the starches and so on. So after they lost the weight, they randomized them to these four groups. And again, you can see that again, most of the groups regained the weight. There was only one group really which stood out that didn't seem to regain that weight over the next six months. And that was the high protein, low glycemic index. So these fattening carbohydrates seem to have an impact, not just on the initial weight loss, but also keeping it off. So again, this was, um, this was something that was published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was really a bit of a surprise to a lot of people that not only are they cause better short-term weight loss, but they also are healthier, and they may have a bit better effect in terms of the durability of this. Recently, a study was published um, by uh, David Ludwig in 2012 looking at why this is. And remember we talked about the energy expenditure. That is, after a certain amount of weight loss, your body actually reduces its energy expenditure. And by reducing its energy expenditure, that is how many calories you burn on a daily basis, you actually start to regain a lot of that weight. So he took, um, he took a number of patients and put them on three different diets and tried to see what the difference in energy expenditure was. So there's three groups, the low fat, low glycemic index, and the very low carbohydrate. You can see that the low fat group here on the left actually seems to cause the greatest reduction in energy expenditure. That is, if you normally expend 2,000 calories a day, after you go on a diet, your energy expenditure will go down. That is, instead of expending 2,000 calories a day, it might go down to 1,800. Therefore, if you continue to eat 2,000, you will actually regain some of that weight. And it's the, the effect seems to be the worst in the low-fat diet, the American Heart Association diet that we had been all told to follow. And the least reduction, almost no reduction, was the very low carbohydrate. So that might explain a little bit why, uh, of why uh, it might have been a bit more of a durable effect. Um, in the same article, he notes that these low glycemic load in, uh, diets, which are uh, low in carbohydrates, they actually tend to be the healthiest uh, in terms of the triglycerides and the cholesterol as well. So really, if you take all these studies, all these recent studies uh, that have been published really within the last 10 years, they're all um, remarkable in their consistency. That is, they really show the same thing. One is that diets really are quite hard to follow because no matter what diet you put people on, there's about a 40% dropout rate. That is, um, even on an Atkins diet versus another diet, they're not particularly easy to follow. People tend to go back to what they're used to eating. Uh, the second thing is that if you're going to look at short-term weight loss, the Atkins seems to do the best. And really the best metabolic profile, so both in terms of sugars, uh, cholesterol and weight tends to be on an Atkins style diet. And two things that we've always kind of been told but really don't seem to be true is that eating fat does not make you fat. So that's kind of something that's kind of been talked about for a while but it's clear that the high fat diets such as the Atkins diets are not actually that fattening. In fact they may actually be better for you than these high carbohydrate diets, pasta rich, uh, rice diets, so on. The other thing that's really interesting is that eating cholesterol does not raise your cholesterol. Because again, you've seen the packages low in cholesterol, you know, no cholesterol. It's actually irrelevant what, how much cholesterol you eat. Because if you look at the Atkins diet, they're eating double or triple the amount of cholesterol that the low fat people were eating yet their cholesterols were substantially better. Their good cholesterols were higher, there was no difference in their bad cholesterols, but the triglycerides were like 30% better. So all those, all those packages that say low cholesterol, you could ignore them because it, it just simply doesn't matter. The same goes for foods that are high in cholesterol, high in dietary cholesterol like uh, shrimp and egg yolks. It doesn't, there's no reason that you need to, to, to avoid them because the dietary cholesterol really has very little to do with your cholesterol. Okay, so all these people who are eating high cholesterol diets, they didn't do worse. In fact, they did better. So if you look at the metabolic syndrome, the metabolic syndrome is um, a cluster 
of uh, risk factors for heart disease. And they all seem to run together. So I've listed on the uh, right here the American Thoracic Society uh, criteria for metabolic syndrome. And on the left here, I've uh, indicated what we know about diets, and particularly diets high in refined carbohydrates, so the fattening carbohydrates such as pastas and breads and so on. And what you can see is that the criteria, the, the medical criteria for metabolic syndrome is abdominal obesity, which seems to be made worse by these diets high in refined carbohydrates. The second thing is the triglycerides being high. That's one of the characteristics of the metabolic syndrome. And again, we know that these diets high in refined carbohydrates also tend to be worse for the triglycerides. The good cholesterol, HDL, is low. That's part of the metabolic syndrome. And again, that's one of the things that you know you're going to get when you follow the low-fat diets. High blood pressure, again, and high blood sugars. All of these are made worse by diets high in refined carbohydrates. So remember, the scariest part of this of all, of course, is that these diet, this diet, this low-fat diet, was the exact diet that we've been told to follow for the last 40 years. And all of these things are exactly the ones that we get when we get metabolic syndrome. And there's been this explosion of metabolic syndrome within the last 20 years. And why is that? Is that because patients weren't listening to their doctors? Hardly. This is exactly what we've been telling people to do. It's actually because patients were listening to their doctors. They were following this low-fat diet. They were trying to eat more bread, more bread, more pasta, because it was low in fat, it was low in cholesterol. You know, avoid the uh, meat and the eggs and you threw out the egg yolk because you didn't want the cholesterol and all that sort of thing. And then you ate another couple slices of bread. It turns out that that's just going to give you the metabolic syndrome. And that's exactly what we saw. It wasn't because you weren't listening, it was because you were listening. And insulin resistance is really the key to the whole metabolic syndrome. You can see it when you, when you take patients with the same weight. So you can take patients with the same uh, body mass index, so it means this, they're the same weight. And you can divide them into a group, three groups. One group with low uh, insulin resistance, medium and high insulin resistance. And then see what the difference between those three groups are. So, okay, so these three groups of patients are all the same weight, they're all apparently healthy, that is, they don't have any disease that you know of, and split them into three groups according to their insulin resistance. And you can see that there's much higher high hypertension, so high blood pressure, much worse uh, triglycerides, much worse of the good cholesterol, and the impaired fasting glucose, which is the sugars. So all of these things tend to run together. And it's all dependent on the insulin resistance. The insulin resistance is really the key to the whole metabolic syndrome. Insulin resistance is diabetes. It's also the same thing. And what you can see is that these diets may depend on how much insulin resistance you have. Because they took, this is a, a trial uh, done a few years ago. They took 73 uh, patients and they again randomized them to a low fat diet and a low glycemic load diet, so low in carbohydrates, you know, Atkins style. And overall there was no difference, but when they split the groups into insulin sensitive and insulin resistant groups, what they found was that the insulin sensitive group, there was no difference, but the insulin resistant group, they did much better on the low carbohydrate diets. That is, if you're starting to get diabetes, if you're very sensitive to those carbohydrates, it's better to restrict them. The other thing that's very interesting is that we're, we all worry about eating too much fat and eating too much cholesterol because we, we thought it would make us fat. So the thing is that dietary fat, which is predominantly triglycerides, funny enough, it actually doesn't raise your triglycerides. So you think that eating these triglycerides, eating this fat is going to make your triglycerides worse because it is triglycerides, but it doesn't. Because what happens when you eat a lot of this dietary fat is that your body actually shuts down production of its own fat, its own triglycerides. So in the end, there's actually no difference in your levels of triglycerides. So these are, this is, you know, the highest, the higher the triglycerides, the worse it is. On the other hand, if you eat a lot of refined carbohydrates, what happens is that this actually has no triglycerides, 
but because of the effect on insulin, it actually turns on the production of fat. So it turns on the production of triglycerides. And what you get is you get all this fat accumulated in the liver. You get all this fatty liver. So your liver is f big, and, some, and this is actually one of the major causes of liver failure. So even though the carbohydrates don't have triglycerides, it turns on the production of triglycerides. Whereas if you eat fat, it actually doesn't make any difference. And we actually already knew this because if you look at <coughs> foie gras, which is the fatty liver of a goose or duck, we know how to give ducks fatty liver. You force feed them. So this is how they make foie gras. They take a uh, bucket, they shove a tube down <laughs> the poor duck's neck and they feed it, they force feed it food, okay? And what is the food that they use? High starch corn mash. Because if you give it protein, of course, it's not gonna do anything. So they give it carbohydrates. They give it lots of carbohydrates. And what you get is the duck or the goose suddenly gets this big fatty liver and then when you kill it, you get foie gras, which is a delicacy. But we know how to give ducks fatty liver. It actually is the analogous situation in humans. The excess carbohydrates or excess refined carbohydrates is what's going to give you the fatty liver. So if we look at the hormonal obesity theory as we understand it now, so not only, so the, the insulin levels is still the key player, okay? The fat, fattening carbohydrates is a key player. The insulin resistance, as we see, is very important. It's really the key to the whole thing. Fiber is protective because it tends to decrease your insulin levels. But we can see that it's not simply obesity anymore we're talking about. It's actually much, much more than that. We're talking about obesity, hyperlipidemia, so high triglycerides, uh, low cholesterol, low, low good cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, and fatty liver. This metabolic syndrome, which all goes together, is actually part and parcel of the whole insulin resistance syndrome. So you can see that, you know, by attacking your insulin levels, you're actually doing far more for yourself than simply losing the weight. It actually impacts all those things that we try to treat with medication for the most part. Now there's a few things about the Atkins diet which people have always worried about. So when it was very popular, they used to, uh, there, there's all these arguments why you shouldn't do the Atkins diet. One of it was that it was all water. That is, you know, all the weight that you lose is water. And that's true. Because if you lower your serum insulin levels by eating these uh, foods low in refined carbohydrates, uh, insulin tells the body to retain salt and water. So if you, if you eat less of these foods and your insulin levels go down, you will actually get rid of a lot of this water. And in fact, a lot of the initial weight loss that you see on the Atkins diet was water loss. So you'd see, you know, five, six pounds go within the first week. Uh, that, that's too fast to be fat loss. That's mostly water loss. And so they say, oh, it's just water loss. But that's actually a good thing. Because who wants these big swollen ankles, right? We give people medication to get rid of the salt and water. We give people diuretics, uh, blood pressure pills to get rid of the salt and water. And so here's an all natural way you can get rid of this excess salt and water. And you can see it because you don't get those uh, swollen ankles, but also the blood pressure tends to go down because as you're getting rid of the salt and water, your blood pressure may also fall, which is exactly what you saw in the Atkins style diet. The second thing that a lot of people say is that it's bad for the kidneys. And this is a real concern because if it's, uh, people used to say if it's very high in protein, uh, like a high meat diet, it may be bad for the kidney. And uh, part of it is uh, true. If it's too high in protein, there certainly could be a concern about that. But when they took those, uh, when they, they, they did those studies of people uh, where they randomized them to high protein or low protein, what they found was that in healthy people, they actually could find no difference. There's no noticeably harmful effects on the kidneys or any uh, noticeable effects on the urine or the electrolytes or anything like that. So two studies have been published uh, on this already. So in relatively healthy people, there actually is no concern for the kidneys. For kidney patients, there probably is, you probably do need to be monitored a little bit more closely.
But the major complaint people had with the Atkin style diet was that it's nutritionally unbalanced, right? So this is a, a picture of the um, Choose My Plate, which is one of these government programs. And you can see they've divided the plate into kind of uh, four things. One of the major things is the grain. So like a quarter, a third, a half of your plate should be grains, right? And then there's fruits, vegetables, protein, and dairy as well. And this, um, this is, um, you know, the, the, the balanced diet. And that actually has a few things. The underlying assumption is that for some reason they believe that refined grains actually provide essential nutrients, right? If it didn't provide essential nutrients, it wouldn't be part of the thing. So you can see that um, proteins and vegetables and fruits, yes, you can say that they are essential nutrients. But grains, for some reason they say that there actually is essential nutrients, but there isn't. The truth is that if you take a slice of white bread, you really are getting no essential nutrients out of it. In fact, by refining it into white flour, they actually have to add back nutrients. Because if you eat the un, um, unenriched flour, you'll actually very quickly develop nutritional deficiencies. So they actually had to add back thiamine and they had to add back folic acid. They had to add back all these nutrients. So the actual refined flours that they make pastas and breads out of, they actually had no nutrients at all. The other thing to remember is that in the body, there are essential fats and there are essential amino acids, that is essential proteins. That is, those are foods that you must eat in order to, to survive. You must have certain fats and you must have certain proteins, but there are no essential carbohydrates. So that is, you could eat a diet which is essentially devoid of carbohydrates and still survive. In fact, many cultures have done this. So the uh, Inui in uh, you know, northern Canada, they ate a lot of whale and blubber and that sort of thing. The traditional diet, nothing grows, right? There's no wheat up there, right? There's no grains up there. So they actually essentially ate zero carbohydrates. But it didn't matter. They were still very healthy. There are no essential carbohydrates. So in fact, the carbohydrate restricted diet should actually be healthier for you than the, uh, than the non one because you're actually forced to eat all these other foods which actually have nutrients. The other thing they talk about refined carbohydrates is are they addictive? Because that's the thing, if you have an addictive food, then it's no longer just the hunger. And that actually might be true because if you think about it, there are many things which people say they're addicted to, which is that they can't stop eating. And if you think about them, and I've listed some of them on the right, they all tend to be very heavy in the carbohydrates. That is the sugars or the flour. So whether it's cookies or pastas or breads uh, or candy, people do get addicted to these. That is, you start eating and you can't really stop. But nobody ever says, oh, I'm addicted to salmon, right? I can't stop eating salmon. Like, nobody ever says that. So proteins or, or unrefined carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, but in their natural state. Nobody ever says, oh, I'm addicted to apples. I can't stop eating them. I just keep eating them. Nobody ever says that. But for, for things like bread, which is not even that sweet, there are people, my son included, and he just can't stop eating it. He loves the bread. And it might be because they're addictive. A lot of people believe that. And there actually is some data to suggest that these refined carbohydrates are actually addictive. If you look at uh, functional MRI studies, that is, they took people, and they stuck them in an MRI and they gave them uh, certain foods and they measured the blood flow in the brain. What they found was this, there's a difference between glucose and fructose, that is uh, fructose which is seen in a lot of sugars, um, does not turn off the satiety pathway, that is if you eat regular foods, which is glucose, your hypothalamus, which is the reward pathway, eventually turns off. So you eat enough, you get full, your reward pathway turns off and you say, okay, I can't eat anymore. But that doesn't seem to happen with fructose, which is, um, you know, 50% of sugar is fructose. It doesn't seem to happen. That is, you can keep going and going. It doesn't seem to turn off. You still feel that reward um, from eating sugars, fructose. That is, if you eat, for instance, a slice of roast beef, at first, it's going to taste really, really good. But when you're full and completely stuffed, it doesn't taste so good anymore. It's not like you can keep going. 
because the reward pathways are turned off. But if you take ice cream, which is full of sugar, you can actually just keep going because these reward pathways never really turn off. So it's possible that these things are addictive. And if you think about a lot of comfort foods, so foods that give us comfort, when you're feeling a little low, you want to just get a little something to make you feel better. Again, these are all foods that are very high in refined carbohydrates. So, you know, apple pie and ice cream, and they're all very high, and they give you a bit of a reward <laughs> because that's what they're meant to do. But nobody ever suggests that, oh, you should go and eat a 10-ounce steak. It's not really a comfort food. It's delicious, but it's not really a comfort food. So this is one of the keys, is that if you try to overeat these unrefined foods, it's very, very difficult. That is, if you remember back, we were talking about overfeeding studies, where they take groups of patients and they try to make them eat to gain weight. Okay. So Ethan Sims, which is an endocrinologist who did these studies, he would say that, yeah, you try and make them eat, you give them a plate of uh, pork chops, and they'd sit at it staring at it for hours. Because, you know, when you eat enough pork, you just don't want to eat anymore, right? And it's the same with unrefined carbohydrates. You, once you had enough, you just can't keep going. You can't just keep eating and eating the whole bushel of apples. Yeah, after a few, you're going to say, oh, okay, that's just enough. But that's not true when you're talking about refined carbohydrates. When you're talking about refined carbohydrates, you actually could keep going. You could keep going. You could eat the whole tub of ice cream. You could whole, eat the whole stack of pancakes. It just doesn't stop. So there's no satiety hormones for these refined carbohydrates. That is, for natural foods, we actually have a natural system to reduce, to say that, okay, that you've had enough. But for these kind of ref highly refined foods, we probably bypass them because these are foods that are not found, you know, in their natural state. So we probably bypass the satiety signals, which tell our body that we've eaten enough of those. And that's the real key. If you're going to eat natural unrefined foods, it's actually very difficult to overeat <coughs> them. And in fact, they did this study uh, with, with a group of patients. They uh, gave them... 14 days of a low carbohydrate diet, very, very tight restrictions, 20 grams a day, which is like the induction phase of the Atkins diet. But they didn't put them on any calorie restrictions. You could eat as much as you want, but what they restricted was the carbohydrates. And they ten, took 10, 10 uh, diabetic patients, and what they found was that their body weight went down, but once you took away their carbohydrates, the refined carbohydrates, the calorie intake substantially decreased as well. And what's even more important is that the insulin levels, uh, when you took them all away, significantly went down. So if you're eating a lot of foods that are high in carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, your insulin levels just spike up. And that's really what drives the obesity in the long term, as well as drives the insulin resistance. So what they said in the study was that when we took away the carbohydrates, the patients spontaneously reduced their daily uh, energy consumptions by 1,000 calories a day. So even though there was no restriction on how many calories you could eat, they ate less anyway because they were full. You just have to listen to your body. Not only that, is, but because the insulin levels went down, the insulin sensitivity went up. So this is at the end of it. You can see that they had a much better insulin sensitivity and that gets back to the fact that it's the high insulin levels which drives that vicious cycle of high insulin and high insulin resistance. So this is what we talk about in the hormonal obesity theory that is if it's the high insulin levels which drives the resistance as your insulin level comes down then your resistance starts to come down as well. But the problem is this, what was the long-term results of all this? Because, you know, the Atkins diet was very popular in the 1990s and the early 2000s, but it quickly faded. It's not really all that popular anymore. If you look at what people follow, it just wasn't all that effective in the long term. So in the short term, it looked better. And what was really important was that it was not a very, uh, it was not a uh, dangerous diet by any means and might be actually healthier. But when you took all these studies together and looked at long-term results, this is what you found. The weight loss wasn't as good as you thought it would be. So at six months, if you took a number of studies and kind of clumped them all together, 
you see that there is about a four kilogram weight loss at six months, which is about 10 pounds roughly. But at 12 months, it was only one kilogram. So really not as good as you might have expected. And if you look at, at two years, this is a study where they looked at low fat versus Atkins. So there was no difference by 12 months and by 24 months. It really wasn't as good as you thought it would be. Even in that initial study uh, that was done in Israel, the SHI study, um, what they found was that, okay, at six months or, or at 24 months, because the compliance was so much better, they were doing better. The low fat diet was uh, not doing as well as the Atkins. But by 72 months, a lot of the benefits just kind of started to go away. So it wasn't as good as you thought. And the reason that people got confused with all this is that it's the insulin levels that you really need to keep a track of, not the glucose levels. So a lot of these low glycemic index diets um, talk about the glucose, but it's not the glucose which is important. It's the insulin which drives the obesity. So not only do uh, the fattening carbohydrates raise insulin, but it turns out that protein raises insulin as well. So protein, if you look at uh, different foods, you can measure how much um, they raise their insulin levels. So certainly the worst offenders are here with the snacks, the bakery products, and the carbohydrate-rich foods, okay? So your breads, your pastas, your desserts, they all raise insulin quite a bit. But just after that, the protein-rich foods also raise your insulin levels. So remember the protein, like salmon and beef and so on, they don't raise your glucose, but they still raise your insulin levels. So if you look at the, the correlation between how much it raises your sugar and how much it raises your insulin, it only accounts for about 23% of the variability. So it's not 100%. That is, foods that don't raise your glucose can still raise your insulin. So again, if you look at these are cereals, so all bran and porridge, and this is corn flakes, honey smacks. So they all raise your insulin scores, but so do eggs, cheese, beef, lentils, and fish. So they also raise your insulin levels. If it's the insulin levels which are driving your obesity, these foods, the high protein foods, while not as bad as bread and pasta, are still raising your insulin levels. If you look at the three uh, macronutrients, so fat, fat is probably the best because, um, because they tend to raise the insulin levels the least. If you look at carbohydrates, for instance, carbohydrates, as you take more carbohydrates, your insulin level tends to go up. If you look at proteins, if you look at proteins, as you take more protein, it tends to go down a bit, but you can see it's only this one line. Most protein you can't eat that high of protein, but the insulin scores are all over the place. Fat is probably the best because you can see there's a clear trend towards higher fat meals causing less insulin spikes. But the scale of this is much less because this only goes up to 140, these go up to 200. So the protein foods, while not as bad as the carbohydrate foods, are still going to raise your insulin levels. If you look at different proteins, they actually have different effects. So whey protein, which is a dairy protein, actually seems to have the highest effect on the insulin. Fish is also very high, and egg seems to be one of the lower uh, amounts. So there is a difference, uh, just like with the carbohydrates. Um, if you look at the uh, insulin resistance now, this is a very interesting study looking at eight-year-old uh, boys. Um, because what they did was they gave them protein basically either in the form of meat or in the form of uh, milk. Milk has a lot of those dairy proteins, which actually tend to raise the insulin levels the most. So remember, if it's the insulin levels that are going up, that's going to be driving the weight gain. And you can see that after seven days, the insulin is much higher on the milk group than the meat group. But what's even more scary is that if you look at the amount of insulin resistance, so high insulin levels can lead to high insulin resistance. By day seven, you can see that the milk group has much worse insulin resistance than the meat group. So even after seven days, you can see these differences in response. So certain proteins, particularly the dairy proteins, can be very high.
This is looking at, again, the difference between meat and milk. These are milk and cheese. You can see the insulin response is much higher with that than, say, for cod. And remember that insulin is the driver of obesity because no, none of these foods are going to raise your blood sugar level significantly. And the other thing is that if you have a lot of insulin resistance, that is also going to drive that vicious cycle of higher insulin levels. This is the same sort of thing looking at milk and whey, which is that dairy protein. And if you look at the insulinogenic index, uh, this is area under the curve, how much insulin you've secreted in response to that food, you can see that really uh, milk and whey are up here and this is whole wheat bread, which is actually way down here. So that's very interesting and much different from what we would have thought because meats are somewhere in the middle, cod, cheese, but milk is way up here and even worse than the bread. And what's interesting is that there's actually a substantial amount of um, correlative, correlative data which looks at uh, animal protein and diabetes. So if you look at, um, this is the uh, animal protein and vegetable protein, and they looked at this EPIC study, which is a very large study done in Europe looking at the influence of diet and cancer predominantly. But they also looked at proteins, animal proteins, vegetable proteins. So animal proteins tend to be much more insulinogenic. That is, animal proteins tend to raise your insulin levels more. And what you can see is that if you break them into four quartiles, so you take people, and these are the people who eat the most animal protein, and these are the people who eat the least animal protein, you can see that there's a steady rise in your incidence of diabetes with the more animal protein you take. Now this is a correlation, that is that this, it doesn't imply that one causes the other, but certainly there's some kind of association between animal protein and veg, uh, uh, which is not true of vegetable protein. And even more interesting is that they looked at the uh, fish, because everybody thinks, oh, fish is really, really good for you, and it, it is. However, you can also link the intake of fish with the incidence of diabetes. So here again, if you break them into five quintiles, so um, you, you break people into five different groups, one which eats the most fish, and one which eats the least fish, and then you look at them and say, who has the most diabetes? You think that eating fish is really, really good for you, but in fact, there's actually a higher risk of diabetes when you eat the fish. Not a lot higher, but a little bit higher. So there's clearly a correlation there, and this is a prospective trial of almost 200,000 patients over 14 to 18 years. So it's a very long-term study. But because the fish also raises the insulin, therefore you may also f expect that as you take more fish, you may get more insulin resistance, which means that you have more diabetes. So finally, you can understand some of these studies, which is looking at the weight gain. So this is a very interesting paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they took uh, 120,000 uh, patients and they just said, Let's look at what they eat and how much weight they gain. So on average, they gained about 3.3 pounds every four years, or roughly a pound a year, which is probably uh, average of what people do. And let's see what they eat and see if there's any differences in what people eat. So you can see that the foods here on the, so this means that they gain more weight when you eat this food. And you can see that potato chips and french fries uh, are very high on that list, okay? And that's no surprise because they're going to raise your insulin levels, their fatty carb uh, they're, they're fattening carbohydrates. But right after that is meat. So unprocessed uh, red meat and processed meats. That also tends to be fairly high. And you wouldn't be able to understand it until you realize that the meat also raises your insulin levels. It's all about the insulin levels. The butter is the same because butter, even though it's a lot of fat, has a lot of this dairy, dairy proteins, the refined grains and the sweets for sure. What is, uh, protect, uh, what is protective is these whole grains and fruits. So a lot of people on the Atkins diet were very against these whole grains and that sort of thing. But in fact, in this study, it seems to be correlated with a protective effect. 
and that's possibly due to the protective effect of the fiber, which we talked about the last time. The fiber, which is going to act to reduce the insulin, which acts almost as an antidote, reduces the insulin, is going to be expected to reduce your incidence of diabetes as well as weight loss. So this is what we have here. So we have not only the, uh, so again, the major player here is still going to be the insulin, but not only the fattening carbohydrates, but the animal proteins are going to be very important. And again, the major players, as you, as you increase your insulin levels, you get this insulin resistance, which is a time-dependent uh, effect. That is, the longer you have it, the worse your effect is. And what you can see is that most of what we eat, actually, are going to raise the insulin level. So this is a um, from the Food Abil Availability 2010. This is what Americans eat. And you can see that the majority of what they eat are going to raise the insulin levels substantially. So the meat, eggs, not so much nuts, but it's lumped in there in, the, in that category. The sweeteners, the flour and the sugar, and the dairy. The added fats and oils, I think, are also very bad for you uh, because we tend to eat a lot of these refined oils. Uh, but we'll cover that in a separate topic. But the only thing which is uh, not going to substantially be a problem for the insulin is the fruits and vegetables, which is really only 8% of the diet. So you can see most of the diet that we eat is actually quite insulogenic. So um, a couple of other things that we have to talk about, which is the, um, the, the hunger, uh, because this speaks to some of the other hormonal systems that we haven't really addressed yet because there's also, an, uh, other than the insulin, a number of other factors, one of which is the hunger. So this is uh, the way that hunger is. It's actually mediated through the brain, but there's a number of other hormones that are important. So there's ghrelin, CCK, insulin, leptin. And um, what is interesting is that it. Some people feel that it's um, a necessary condition of losing weight. You have to be hungry. But actually, it's not really true. If you're hungry, it means that your, cell, your body is not getting enough energy. Um, and it's very hard to ignore. You can't just go hungry all the time. You can do it for three months, six months, but you can't do it all the time. If you get hungry, you actually need to eat. But it's a matter of selecting the proper foods which you need to eat. So if you look at the uh, satiety hormones, that is the hormones that tell our body that we're full, there's two of them called cholecystokinin, which is CCK, and pancreatic peptide YY. And they actually act in the gut. So as you eat food, and particularly protein-rich foods and fat-rich foods, what you find is that they secrete CCK, which is that hormone, and it acts on the brain. And same with the the pancreatic peptide YY. In response to protein, it's, it's secreted. And it basically feeds back to the body and tells you you're full. So that's very important because as you eat protein-rich and fat-rich foods, you will become full. Whereas that is not quite the case when you're eating highly refined uh, carbohydrates. When you're eating those, there are no uh, satiety hormones like that. And that's why Dr. William Osler, all the way back in the 19, early 1900s, said you must eat more fat. Because if you eat more fat, your body will become full. Leptin was a very interesting topic, which is discussed sometimes. So leptin was discovered in 1994, and they thought it was so important, they called the gene the OB gene for the obese gene. And what leptin is, is it's actually produced by the fat cells. So as, the, as you get more fat cells, your leptin level goes up and it feeds back into the brain and the brain says, okay, I'm over my weight, you know, don't eat so much anymore. So they thought that, oh, this is what's going to be the case. Leptin is, you're going to have too little leptin. Therefore, you're, if we give people leptin, that should make them thin. And the drug companies were very excited about this. They rushed out and they tried to make all this leptin. So they took a, a number of patients and they just gave them leptin. And according to this theory, they should all lose weight. The problem was they didn't. In fact, they didn't lose any weight. It turns out that the, the, the state of obesity is actually a leptin-resistant uh, state. That is, you're resistant to the effect of the leptin. So your fat cells are producing this leptin which is telling your body that you need to lose weight, but your brain is blocking it out. It's resistant to the effect of the leptin. 
And it's probably because of the insulin. So as you have high insulin levels, which leads to the obesity, what happens is that your leptin level goes up. But since your leptin level is raised all the time, you just become resistant to it. It's kind of uh, like anything in the body. If you, um, you know, uh, take any hormonal system, as you, uh, as you are continually exposed to that hormone, your body eventually becomes resistant, just like when you go from the dark to the light. It seems very bright at first, but then you adapt. It's the same thing. If you're always having high leptin levels, eventually it just becomes uh, resistant to it and it loses its effect. So it turns out that that, which a lot of people talk about, is probably not that relevant anymore. The insulin, by driving the obesity and the high levels, probably caused the resistance. So I'm going to spend the last part of the talk talking about cortisol because if you remember to the first part of the talk, we talked about there's two systems really. There's the insulin system which causes the obesity and the cortisol which also causes the obesity. So cortisol is actually called the stress hormone because it causes the flight or fight response. And it's basically uh, does a number of things. It increases the blood sugars to prepare your body for action. It breaks down muscle tissues. And when we give it in the form of uh, prednisone, it causes a lot of problems, one of, it, of which is weight gain. So we know that high cortisol levels can lead to high, uh, higher weight gain. And this is, uh, this is independent of the whole insulin pathway. But nevertheless, since it is a contributor, a hormonal contributor to obesity, we have to talk about ways that you can reduce cortisol. So really, a lot, a lot of you already kind of have a feeling that stress contributes to weight gain. And you all know people, and I've known people, who, got, who went under a lot of stress and they gained like 30 pounds. Um, and that's really due to the cortisol effect. That's not much to do with the insulin effect, but there are ways to reduce the cortisol. So in this very interesting study, uh, I think it was done in uh, University of California, San Francisco. They took a number of patients and they gave them a number of treatments which were designed to reduce stress. So this is yoga, meditation, group discussions. And what you see is that you can actually reduce their cortisol levels, which is very important. So if you look at the obese patients and uh, what happened to the treatment, they reduced their cortisol levels substantially, as where, whereas the patients treated normally had no difference. And you could correlate that to the amount of uh, fat reduction. So as you, uh, your cortisol level starts to go down, your abdominal fat level also starts to go down, which kind of makes sense. So there are ways to reduce the cortisol level which are important. So we all think that you know, relaxation is uh, natural to us, but it actually isn't quite so natural to us. There are many, many uh, um, different ways to, um, to reduce stress. And it's like anything else. It's not just a matter of going to sleep. I mean, it's something you have to do actively. Uh, one of uh, the things that has uh, been used for, you know, thousands of years is meditation. And it's really a good way to really calm the mind and it reduces the cortisol levels. And so there's, um, there's ways you can do it. There's transcendental uh, meditation. There's different ways you can do it. But nevertheless, this is something called active relaxation. That is, it's something you actually have to do to relax. It's not something that you're just not doing, like, um, you know, I'm just going to lie in bed all day kind of thing. No, that's not what it is. It's actually something which you have to practice, which you have to learn how to do. And it's very easy. But it's something you can do every day for 10, 15 minutes. You may actually feel a lot better too because as you reduce your cortisol levels, you are more relaxed as well as you're going to be affecting your weight because you're going to be reducing your cortisol. So the basic method of, um, of meditation is basically this. You basically get comfortable. Uh, you try and clear your mind. And then you concentrate on either a word or a breathing. And just practice body awareness. You want to be able to feel your whole body. And you try and stay in tune with your breathing or that word. And if your thoughts stray, you kind of try and bring it back around to that. And you do that for 10 or 15 minutes every day. At first, it's very difficult. But after a while, it gets easier. And it's something that you can do. You don't have to, you know, it doesn't depend on the weather. You can do it in the comfort of your own home. And it actually is very good. There's books on it. There's videos on how to do it. But it is something which is also going to contribute to weight. 
There's other ways you can uh, reduce cortisol. There's massage, which is a very good method, and also yoga. All of these methods have been used, again, for thousands of years, and uh, only, uh, you know, they're, they've basically withstood the test of time. Sleeping is the other thing that's very, very important, because, again, there's a very strong correlation between uh, sleep deprivation and weight gain. So if you look at large studies such as the nurse's health study, uh, those women who didn't get enough sleep, they had a higher risk of, of weight gain. And again, if you're not sleeping properly, that's going to contribute to your stress levels. Um, in this study, they looked at uh, sleep deprivation and impaired fasting glucose, which is again that insulin resistance and really the first step in developing diabetes. And you can see that compared to the six to eight hour group, those ones who didn't get enough sleep, less than six hours a night, had a much higher, almost a tripling of their rate of impaired fasting glucose. And if you take patients and just sleep deprive them, so they, this is a, they took 12 healthy men, and they basically put them on sleep deprivation or not. And then they measured different things, including their hormones. What they found is that the sleep deprived group is actually much hungrier. And if you look at appetite, their appetite is higher. So that's nothing to do with the food you eat or anything like that. That's simply due to sleep deprivation and the effect of stress. So if you look at hunger hormones, such as ghrelin, that is, that is a, um, the higher it is, that hormone is, the hungrier you feel, it's actually up by 28%, just due to the effect of sleep deprivation. So leptin is also uh, decreased. When you're trying to lose weight, it's actually very important to make sure you get enough sleep. Because again, this is a study where they took patients and they crossed them over. So some of them they would sleep and then after that they would be sleep deprived and some of them went the other way around. And what you found was that in terms of weight loss, they're pretty equal. But if you look at the fat loss, it actually is much better if you get enough sleep. And in terms of the lean muscle loss, again, you lose less muscle if you are getting enough sleep. So again, a few things about sleep. I mean, it's very important to uh, observe these, and this is something called the sleep hygiene, which is the area which you sleep has to be, uh, you know, it needs to be dark, you need to be comfortable, loose-fitting clothes, uh, you need to have regular sleeping hours. I mean, these are things that you can do. Medications, I, I don't really think is the answer, um, but it's really important to get enough sleep because a lot of us are busy and we have other things to do, but if you're trying to lose weight, you're really going to do yourself a big favor if you get enough sleep. So I've put in here, so this is how we think about it. So I've added the high protein and I've added the cortisol in here and we have the entire metabolic syndrome. So the question is, in the end, what to eat? What do we eat in order for us to lose weight? Well, um, what's kind of replaced the Atkins diet is the Paleolithic diet in terms of uh, popular diets. And that's really a diet saying we should just be eating um, unrefined foods, foods as they are found in nature. And there really is a lot to be said for that because, you know, the healthy diet is likely the ones that were adapted to eat. That is, if you take a cow and you feed it um, beef, it's not going to like it. And if you take a lion and you feed it grass, it's not going to like it either. But it's not that the grass is better for you or the beef is better for you. It's the one that you're designed to eat. So if there are foods that we're designed to eat, that should be healthy for us. So unrefined foods, real foods, we should be healthy for us. But when, once you start getting into the refined foods, you know, once you start getting into the flours and the packaged foods and the sugars, which are all highly refined, that's probably where the, uh, the toxicity of the food lies. Not in the food, but in the refining. If you look at carbohydrates, because carbohydrates get the worst rap of it all. If you look at unrefined carbohydrates, vegetables and so on, in the primitive man, it was all vegetables, fruits, roots, beans. None of those are, also, are, are, are really bad for you. But when we talk about carbohydrates now, it's all bread and pasta and then the sugars, and all of this stuff, which is the unrefined carbohydrates, which, which were never that bad for you in the first place, are really a small percentage of what we talk about. 
So a very good book, which is this one, uh, called The Blood Sugar Solution by Dr. Mark Hyman, he goes through a number of things, um, and I'll give you a copy of these to, to have a look at, but they really make a lot of sense. And basically it comes down to the, the fact that you shouldn't be eating a lot of these highly refined foods. The, uh, there are certain foods that are very good to emphasize, uh, including a lot of these berries and avocados and nuts. And then one that I will touch particularly on is vinegar, because vinegar is a very interesting substance. Because the major effect of the vinegar is that it improves the insulin sensitivity. That is, if you take patients and you give them a meal, that is bread, and you give them bread or bread with vinegar, you can measure their uh, glucose, how high their sugar goes, and you can measure how high their insulin goes. And you see that the vinegar has a very good effect to reduce both, both the sugar and the, this is the sugar, and the insulin level. And if you have insulin resistance, it's even better. So the vinegar really acts just like the fiber to reduce your blood glucose spike and reduce your insulin spike. So this is uh, something which was uh, quite interesting. They actually told these people to take uh, two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar at bedtime. And what they did was they measured their blood glucose uh, the next day. And you can see that after a few days, the fasting blood glucose gets better. So this is the people just drinking apple cider vinegar uh, at nighttime. If you give them... Where do you get this apple cider vinegar? Oh, you just buy it in the supermarket. You can buy it anyway. Um, I'm not sure about the tablets. Uh, it, they might work the same. It's the acid. It reduces the... Yeah, it, it's very good for you. And it's good to put in your foods like the salad dressings and so on, a lot of them. Straight? You, you, you certainly could, but it's kind of sour. So it's, it's, it's probably better to take it in your food. So it's better to put in the salad. Yeah, and the other thing, remember, is that the, it, it, it works to reduce the effect of the other things. So if you're taking this, this is uh, bread, if you take it with different doses of vinegar, you actually get a better and better effect. So as you take bread with more and more vinegar, you know, like the dip you have, oil and vinegar, it's going to reduce your serum insulin levels. So even the same amount of bread, it depends on what you take it with. So the fat will also reduce your, uh, your glucose levels, but the vinegar has a very good effect to do that as well. And the other thing is it tends to make you feel more full. Again, it's thought that the vinegar slows down your gut so that it, it, the, the blood sugar doesn't go as high. Uh, the other thing is it takes longer. So you actually feel more full. Again, this is they took patients and they gave them bread or they gave them bread with vinegar and different doses of vinegar. So if you take it with just the bread, you can see after a number of hours, you start to get hungry again because this is the satiety score. This is how full you get. But you can see that the ones that took it with the vinegar, same amount of bread, but they took it with the vinegar, actually felt full longer. It may make you more full. All levels uh, balsamic vinegar. Yeah, all, all types of vinegar. They're all acid, so uh, it seems that the effect is likely all of them. Apple cider vinegar, red wine vinegar, uh, balsamic vinegar. Now, balsamics can sometimes have a bit of sugar in it, so some of the others might be better. Um, and then the, the, in terms of risk of heart disease, what's, and again, very interesting, is that if you look at a very large study, um, it might be that the vinegar actually protects your heart, too. Because this is a study where they looked, this is the nurse's health study, and they looked at what people ate, and they looked at how much heart disease they got. And they said that there's uh, this thing called alpha-linolenic acid, which is protective. Alpha-linolenic acid is found in both mayonnaise, as well as oil and vinegar dressing. But if you look at the effect of the mayonnaise, mayonnaise has a little bit of a protective effect, a little bit, okay? But look at the oil and vinegar dressing. It has a significant protective effect on the incidence of coronary artery disease. Since they both contain the alpha-linolenic acid, it's certainly possible that it's actually the vinegar which is protecting you. And that makes a lot of sense, because if the vinegar is reducing your insulin, it's going to have the beneficial effects. 
So again, these are the protective factors, and I've added these ones that you really should think about emphasizing. So the fiber is one of the things that we really need to emphasize to really act as an antidote to this insulin. But the other thing that's also very beneficial is the vinegar. The vinegar, as much as you can, you should try and add, add it. The uh, other thing I'm going to just touch on is, you know, who, where are you going to get this information from? Who are you going to get it from? And the thing is that, you know, a lot of times they say, ask your doctor, ask your doctor. And the, the problem is that the doctors usually don't know. Uh, and I know this very well because I went through medical school, I went through training, I did all my training, I did kidney disease. And uh, nutrition impacts really a lot of what I do. In fact, most of what I do. But if you look at the amount of training that I received, it was probably about two or three hours in medical school. Once I got out into training, my internship, my residency, which was a five year long, I don't think I got any training at all. And from then on to now, there's probably zero amount of training in nutrition. So for a fellow who's been practicing medicine for closer to 20 years now, I maybe got five hours of instruction back in medical school and the 12 or 13 years that I've been in full practice really there's been no talk about nutrition no lectures of nutrition so you think you're, that your doctor is really up to date on everything your doctor probably doesn't really know in fact I went to a talk recently for, at the, this diabetes forum and you would think again that the diabetic doctors oh they're gonna be right up to date so I was listening to the talks and there's this fellow he says oh we have this wonderful treatment uh, for hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, anxiety, and side effects. It's called exercise. And that's true. <laughs> Certainly true. But yeah. then he spent the next 59 minutes talking about drugs. The very talk after that, another nice endocrinologist, she said, lifestyle changes uh, should be your first, second, and third choice for diabetes. Absolutely true. She then spent the next 59 minutes out of 60 minutes talking about drugs. So the bottom line is that even though they pay lip service to nutrition, they really know nothing about it. And even what they teach other doctors is all about drugs. So a few years ago, I went to the McMaster General Internal Medicine Conference, four full days of lectures, okay? So really a great comprehensive review of all kinds of stuff. There was one half hour lecture series uh, session devoted to obesity. And what they talked about was drugs and surgery. What he said was, I believe that diet and lifestyle are vital to the treatment of obesity, but this lecture will not discuss that topic. <laughs> so four days of lectures and they don't want to talk anything about diet. So if you're not going to talk about it in a four day review of everything, when are you going to talk about it? And the answer really is never. So you think your doctor knows, but he doesn't know anything. So what did you tell them there after that? <laughs> <laughs> I had to learn it myself. So this is what doctors think about obesity. This is how they should be treated. So Orlistat is one of the drugs they focused on, which actually makes you not absorb the fat. And of course, what happens is that the fat comes leaking out. You get this thing called fecal leakage, uh, which is about as gross as it sounds. Um, you know, this is what doctors think about obesity. Not only that, but you get liver, kidney toxicity, vitamin deficiency. This is one of the drugs they're talking about instead of talking about diet. So, uh, subutramine, which has now been removed from the uh, market because it was increasing heart attacks. You had a 20% increase in the rate of heart attacks uh, or stroke. And this is one of the drugs that they were kept talking to me about. Um, or and weight loss surgery so this is the other thing so let's cut out your healthy stomach exactly or we'll cut out you'll know, put a huge a, a band and so you can't eat this is what doctors think about uh, obesity so just this year actually just a few months ago the New England Journal of Medicine which is really our top journal um, wrote a, a, a little article about obesity and this is what they said well you know, we should give people these meals and meal replacement products, so meal replacement shakes. Some pharmaceutical agents can help patients, so drugs, we should be using drugs. So inappropriate patients, bariatric surgery, so surgery. Okay, so this is what they think about obesity. We should be giving people these meal replacement shakes.
drugs and surgery. So that doesn't even make any sense because clearly it's a dietary issue and yet they talk nothing about the diet. Instead they should be, we should be giving people these highly processed meal replacement shakes. Not only are they slightly gross, but they really ha are, are, are not that good for you. And of course the fellow who wrote it, so he's paid by the Global Dairy Platform, Kraft, the Knowledge Institute for Beer. Okay, this is the guy <laughs> exactly. This is the guy who's writing in the most prestigious journal in medicine, okay, and he's paid by the Knowledge Institute for Beer, McDonald's, yeah. Arena Pharmaceuticals, a drug company, Novo, a diabetes company, Genomics, Jenny Craig, Vivas, all of these things. No wonder he's talking to you about this stuff. He's just trying to sell drugs, give you surgery, sell meal replacement shakes, have you go to McDonald's, drink beer? This is the guy you think is teaching other doctors, okay? That's the really, really scary part. So instead of getting a guy who's completely unbiased, you got this guy who's paid by everybody under the sun who cares only about selling product. And you'd think that the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics would be a good source of information. This is the old American Diabetes Association. Well, here's their corporate sponsors again. You know, Abbott Nutrition, so they're trying to sell meal replacement shakes. Uh, Coca-Cola, National Dairy, Kellogg's, General Mills, Mars, like Mars bars. Like really, these are the people that are teaching the dietitians what to tell you. This is their, um, one of their um, meetings, and you can see, coaching your clients towards lasting weight loss, brought to you by the Coca-Cola company. <laughs> Uh, one of their messages was that sugar is not harmful to children. I mean, you only need to ask your mother about that. She'll tell you all about that, right? And the federal nutrition standards for school meals are too restrictive. All you have to do is pay, right? You pay $50,000 and you can teach the dietitians exactly what they should know. And then maybe the American Heart Association is who you should listen to, right? So you have these health checks. Turns out all you have to do is pay to get these health checks, okay? So um, it's based on certain standards for fats and sodium, but there's no consideration of sugars. So this is the price, right? So if you want one to nine products, it costs you $7,500. Uh, and this is for if you have more products endorsed, you get a, you know, volume discount, right? That it doesn't... Yeah, this is the company pays the American Heart Association to part, put this per product, but you get volume discounts if you put more products on. Uh, and if you want an exclusive deal, you can get an exclusive deal. So the Florida citrus grower said, okay, you will endorse us, so you're not going to endorse the other orange juice guy, and you get an exclusive deal with the American Heart Association. It's all about the dollars. And so in 2009, they've since taken this off, but Cocoa Puffs and Frosted Mini Wheats, which are just full of sugar, they had the Health Check logo in the United States. This is the American Heart Association Heart Walk brought to you by Frito-Lay, and here's Chester the Cheetah, the Cheeto guy, right? So again, you think that the, the American Heart Association is somebody you could trust, but it turns out it's all about the dollars. And in case you think Canada's any better, here's the the Heart and Stroke Foundation logo here on cookies as well as uh, juice, juice which is just full of sugar. You think that, oh, here's the Health Check logo and it tells you that it's been reviewed by the Heart and Stroke Foundation's registered dietitians, but it's, they're cookies. Like really, you don't need to be eating cookies and there's no way these cookies are good for you no matter what they are and here they are. You think you're doing a good job, but you're not. You have to know who to trust, and the only person you can trust is yourself. So these are, this is the way we think about the hormonal obesity theory, so those are the ways that we can uh, adjust it. So really, in terms of practical advice, these are my last few slides, what to eat. The main thing to eat is make sure you eat whole, unrefined, unprocessed foods, because the natural foods are going to be the ones that are healthiest for us. You want to avoid uh, refined carbohydrates, 
We want to find, ref, avoid the refined oils, which we'll talk about later, as well as the processed meats. Anything processed is not really good for you. Avoid the artificial sweeteners. They're, not, they're also like chemicals. They're not really good for you. And you can eat carbohydrates, but you need to make sure they're with, packaged with fiber. So remember, the fiber acts as the antidote. So whenever you go and eat unrefined foods, natural foods, carbohydrates always have fiber with them. It's the, it's the effect of the processing that strips out all the fiber. So in a natural state, if you eat an apple or if you eat a pear or a carrot, um, what it, whatever it is, if you have carbohydrate, you almost always have fiber next to it. Therefore, you can't overeat it. And again, try and stick to the edges of the supermarket and avoid the middle where the highly processed foods are. We covered this the last time is when to eat because there's what to eat and then there's when to eat. You have to make sure you eat the three meals a day and no snacking. Remember the snacking is very bad for you because it keeps the insulin levels high. And then try to eat all your, uh, all your foods within a eight to 10 hour period uh, if you can so that you have a long period of fasting. That is from dinner to breakfast the next day, you got 12 hours, 14 hours where you have nothing to eat and that restores or helps restore the insulin sensitivity. And then the, the thing we talked about this time is the cortisol, which is a different hormonal pathway, but also important in some people. In fact, in some people, it's the major effect. Um, but again, the key here is sleep. But for other things, there's also a number of ways that you can uh, reduce your cortisol. Active relaxation, meditation, massage. Okay, and I think that's the end. Any questions? Okay, one of the, you know, it says there that you, when, when do you eat? Yeah. You're only supposed to have three meals a day. Yeah. And, you know, a period of 